Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Monday the 25th of October. Now, we want to look at this new concept that's coming out now called endemic equilibrium. And we'll also be looking at the uh, vaccination of younger children in the States, which is going to be announced on by the FDA tomorrow. Or at least the, com the adjudicating committee is going to announce it tomorrow. So we'll look forward to that with interest. But it is going to be positive, I'm pretty sure, in that they're going to start vaccinating children between aged uh, 5 and 11. But let's look at some orientation slides first of all, because things change so quickly. Now, these are new daily confirmed cases per million people. So we see that in New Zealand, a little bit of a pickup. Um, Canada going down, Australia going down slightly. Australia's still doing really quite well. But we do notice a couple of European countries, and this is indicative of other European countries, going up. Netherlands, sharp rising cases as we come into autumn. Ireland, a sharp rising cases as we come into autumn. But the United States continuing its downward trend, which is looking very promising. The United Kingdom still going up. But actually, the United Kingdom has been going down for the last four days. And we'll look at this good reason to believe that cases are going to go down in the United Kingdom pretty soon. So um, that is the cases per million. Let's now look at the number of uh, patients in hospital. Uh, again, this is adjusted per capita, of course. So the Netherlands at the bottom, then Canada, Ireland going up, United Kingdom, I'm afraid, still going up. Now, of course, the four day reduction in the United Kingdom is not fed through yet, as you wouldn't expect. So that's still the consequences of the increase in cases over the last few weeks that we've had in the United Kingdom. But hospitalisation in the States going down nicely. But we do notice that they're still higher than the UK, Ireland, Canada and the Netherlands. So although the trend is good, we're not quite there yet with the United States. But good to see that downward trend. And given the, the decrease, decreasing number of cases in the States, we do expect that trend to continue. At least for the uh, the next few weeks anyway. Um, new daily confirmed deaths in the United States. They remain stubbornly high. Look at the high deaths in the States. So New Zealand, low number of deaths, of course. Australia, Netherlands, Canada. Ireland has had an increase. United Kingdom, slight increase, as we would expect from the increase in cases. Uh, but the United States actually remains pretty high. So still no cause for complacency in the States, although there are indications that things are going well, which is good to see. Now, this is the R value. Now, that, that's the that's the R equals one there where each infected patient just replaces themselves. So go in a bit and we see that um, Canada and the um, Canada and the United States are nicely below R. Australia just below R. UK still above it, although the UK is going down. Ireland, Netherlands and New Zealand with a much higher R rate. But there again, the numbers are small in New Zealand. So. Uh, the, the R rate of 1.5 there is a bit misleading, but the Netherlands 1.4 and Ireland about 1.2, 1.3 in Ireland, which is which is um, is um, not a good trend. And then share of the population fully vaccinated. Well, again, this is really quite interesting. We see the United States has dropped below a lot of the other nations. So Australia and New Zealand well and truly taken over the United States now. Then the United Kingdom, then the Netherlands, then Canada, and then Ireland. So um, just a few interesting trends to uh, to, to look at there from, um, from the countries that are following mostly around the world. Now, let's go straight on now and look at um, the kind of um, announcement, really, from the London School of Tropical Medicine um, and Health. Uh, so this is the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now, this is a prognostication model. There are several. This is, this is one of them. This is probably the most prominent one. And they're predicting, along with other modelers, an imminent drop in infections in the UK. So this infection rate that started to go down, and it has gone down over the last four days now. They expect this to carry on going down, or at least they're not saying it's going to go down immediately, but they're saying it's going to go down in the next month or so. Um, cases could fall to around 5,000 a day, new cases by Christmas, which, of course, would be excellent. That would be very good. Now, this is Professor John Edmund, Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases, London School of Tropical, London School of Health and Tropical Medicine, also a member of the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. Um, our model was projecting that cases would start to decline sometime in autumn, so that's looking good they are. However, the model also suggests that cases can start to climb again in spring. But if they're climbing from a base of 5,000, that is slightly less concerning than we could have uh, we could have feared. 
Now, um, why might the cases be going up again due to a combination of waning immunity and increasing contacts? So obviously over winter, people are going to be uh, inside much more. Windows doors are going to be shut because it's cold. There's going to be more indoor transmission for the people that do have the virus. The big unknown here is the waning immunity. So yes, we know that the vaccines is go as, as the vaccines time goes on, the, the amount of protection that the vaccines give against uh, symptomatic disease and infection goes down, as we looked at yesterday. We're still not as clear on, on the degree to which protection against um, severe disease, hospitalizations and death goes down. We're hoping that's going to be maintained because if we get a lot of cases, that doesn't matter too much. It, it's, it's people getting sick that we want. We don't want. So waning immunity, just how much is it going to be? Is it going to affect um, symptomatic disease to some degree? Yes. But if that's just like a common cold, it's no big deal. Is it going to wane in terms of hospitalizations and deaths? We're hoping not, but there's still an unknown there. Increasing contacts are inevitable, as they've said, over winter. Now, cases are currently being driven by high rates in children. So what's happening in the UK at the moment is because children went back to school, although it's half term next week, so that'll give us a bit of a break as well. But because children went back to school, they were passing up from one to another. So there's a lot of school aged children. But then they were taking it back to the 35 to 50 year old age groups, which, of course, is their parents. And, and so there was an increase in that age group as well. So that's what's been driving the recent spike, mostly in the UK. And the virus, uh, th this is this is uh, Professor John Edmonds, viruses close to reaching uh, endemic equilibrium. So endemic means it's going to be with us for some time. But equilibrium means that the cases are going to stay roughly where they are, hopefully at this lowest level of about 5,000 a day. So endemic equilibrium, the virus is going to be here for a good period of time, but we're not going to get this roller coaster of cases that we've had. We're just going to get this constant trickle of cases. But hopefully, because there's going to be a lot of community around, most of those cases are going to be mild and it won't matter too much. In fact, it's almost going to become like the other four common cold coronaviruses that we already have. Is it heading more in that direction? Yes, it seems to be heading more in that direction. So I think there's a lot of scope for encouragement in, in places like the United States and the United Kingdom and Europe. And unless the efficacy and the, the longevity of the vaccines plummets more dramatically than we'd expected. But there's no real sign of that yet, especially in protection against hospitalizations and deaths. So this is a fairly optimistic picture. And of course, if it's endemic and I'm getting reinfected every three months, say, or every six months, as I do with cold viruses or the other coronaviruses then of course every time I get reinfected with SARS coronavirus 2 that's going to give my immunity a boost because I'm going to be re-exposed to it and that's going to re-stimulate my immune system so if I get a minor disease if I, if I get exposed and get a minor disease you could argue that that's a really good thing because it's going to boost my immunity then three four months later I might get it again but that time I might be minimally symptomatic or even asymptomatic which, of course, doesn't concern me too much. So this is this is fairly hopeful that this disease is going to sort of melt into the background. But, of course, many countries are nowhere near that stage yet. So Richie Sunak, speaking for the government, this is our Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, data does not suggest that we should be implementing or moving to Plan B. Plan B is basically that more people work from home. We reintroduce mask mandates and reintroduce some of the restrictions. Now, Maggie Thorpe, UK vaccines minister, plan A is working. And she says the situation, direct quote, where we need to be. So it looks like the vaccine minister here is thinking that the vaccines are going well. And this these ongoing cases that we're getting is actually contributing greatly to herd immunity. Although, as we saw, the hospitalizations were up somewhat. So it could be that the government thinking is, well, um, OK, quite a lot of people have become infected lately, but because we're managing the amount of people that are getting sick, that's all contributing towards this herd immunity that is inevitably going to be the only way that the pandemic is going to fade into the annals of history. Now, moving on to the United States, um, Pfizer and BioNTech submit initial data to the US FDA, children aged 5 to 12. Now, I don't really, this is kind of science by press release. I'm not too keen on this, really. I mean, it's what we've got. So we've got to go with the data that we've got. And uh, if we look, actually look on this paper here, um, vaccines and related biological products. So this is the FDA briefing in more detail for the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine to be used in children five through 11. And that does contain quite a bit more detail. So this is the public domain section 
of what the FDA are going to adjudicate on uh, Tuesday, uh, tomorrow. It's still Monday evening for me, so if you're watching in the States, it'll probably be uh, today. It'll probably be on the Tuesday. So it's kind of good to see that that is a more detailed paper, but still has to be said largely based on the on the Pfizer trial. Um, now, of course, Pfizer have submitted this for peer review, of course. So it will be peer reviewed pretty soon and we expect the methodology to be pretty good. Um, so what's happening? Uh, Pfizer is being is advocating for children aged 5 to 11. The FDA are going to vote on this tomorrow for emergency youth use authorization. On that, you will have your own views. Um, Anthony Fauci said it's going to probably start the first first or second week in November. This could well be starting two shots, three week gap, a third of the adult dose which makes perfect sense, of course, because they're smaller. Um, 250,000 centres across the country have signed up for rollout. 28 million children are in this demographic. So in the United States, 28 million children would become eligible between the ages of 5 and 11. Now, um, these are the uh, references that we've just been uh, looking at here. So they're all there for your uh, perusal and the Pfizer press release as well. Um, now, direct quotes from the Pfizer site. Results are the first from a pivotal trial. So they're, they're not talking this down, are they? Pivotal trial of uh, any COVID-19 vaccine in children under 12 years of age, which is basically true. It's the first big trial data. Uh, well, big-ish trial data. I wouldn't say big, actually. In participants, 5 to 11 years of age. Direct quote from the website. Uh, the vaccine was safe, well tolerated and showed robust neutralising antibody response. Now, there's no question from the data it showed robust neutralising antibody response. As I've said numerous times, I don't like the term safe because safe means it's guaranteed. Um, safe is, is not a term we would normally use in professional healthcare very often because it's an absolute term. But that is the quote from their site. So that is what I am reporting to you. Phase two, three study, United States, Finland, Poland and other places. Children actually in this style, six months to 11 years of age altogether till nearly 12. Uh, now, the number in, the, in the, 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 the so there's about four and a half children between the ages of six months and 11 years. The number in the 11 to um, the five to 11 year old age group was uh, 2,268. Um, yeah, it's a reasonable sample, but it's not massive. Anyway, they received a 10 microgram dose, as we said, a third of the adult dose, 10 microgram dose, uh, in a two dose regime. And they had they had a strong antibody response. And they do give the evidence for that. And there's no question that that will be uh, no question in my mind that the antibody response at least will be substantiated by peer review. Um, the antibodies were measured at good levels one, th one month after the second dose, which is fine. They're continuing to, to accrue safety and efficacy data. So this is what we're particularly interested in. We look forward to their report on their continuance of accruing safety and efficacy data, although it is high. Um, top line readouts for the other two age cohorts. So the other two age cohorts and the younger children are they're also not published yet. It's not before the FDA yet, but two to five years of age and six months to two years of the other group as well. And uh, this this group will be given a smaller dose. I think this dose is this has been given a three microgram dose. Yes, it's just a three microgram dose. So a bit more about the trial: four and a half thousand children altogether, ninety clinical sites all over the world, which is great. Children, there you go. Children under five receive a three microgram dose, so it's a tenth of the adult dose. Trial enrolled children without prior evidence. Tri trial enrolled children with or without evidence of a prior SARS coronavirus two infection, so they can look at the effects of the vaccine after the the uh, the vaccine after infection, as well as people that were naive to the virus. Now, I think we'll um, just have a quick look at the Office for National Statistics. This was quite this was quite interesting. Here, I'll just show you this. Um, this is the gap between what people say and what people do. So people that think hand washing, uh, most people think it's hand washing, is important, but not quite as many people though <laughs> carry it out. So that's kind of interesting. Again, blue line, face covering, red line. Uh, so but, 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 but this is to do with face covering. So the blue line, remember, is uh, what people think. The red line is what people actually do. So that one's fairly similar. Uh, social distancing, though, quite a big uh, difference as people behaviourally aren't socially distancing 
as much as uh, that th they believe would be a good idea. So that was quite quite interesting in that gap between that which is said and that which is done. Anyway, um, probably more important, well, I don't know, it's all, all important, but th th this is a reduction. Th this, this, was, this caught my attention, again, from Office for National Statistics. Uh, reduction in self-reporting long COVID after vaccination. Now, we had thought that this was pretty high. So I must say that when I read this, I was actually pretty, um, well, pretty disappointed, to be quite honest, really. It's much poorer than I uh, had hoped it it, uh, it would be. Um, so Pete, this is a people identifying themselves as experienced persistent symptoms 12 weeks after the first infection. So that's long COVID sort of thing. So after the first vaccine dose was associated with an additional 13% uh, decrease in self-reporting. OK, fair enough. Um, because we're dealing with Delta variant. And I would have thought that it was about another 40% after the second jab, but it wasn't. It was only another 9%. So that's only like a 22% reduction in the likelihood of developing long COVID after two vaccines. This is, well, the Office for National Statistics paint this as a fairly optimistic, that they put this in positive terms. But to me, that's way lower than I had been expecting. So that is pretty disappointing. Now, this is an observational study, so we can't put too much emphasis on it. It's based on people self-reporting. So, again, we can't put too much emphasis on it. But there wasn't a lot of differences between um, social or cultural factors, deprived areas, non-deprived areas, different racial, uh, ethnic background didn't really seem to show any di significant differences. And not a lot of differences between age as well. So probably more to come on that. But... That figure there, that the vaccine reduces your chances of long COVID by 22%, is pretty disappointing, actually. And it could be that there's um, a burden, what we call a burden of morbidity as a result of this. Now, um, that was the other one there. That, that was the gap between the thinking and that which is, <laughs> that which is done. Now, briefly moving on to Australia. Um, Western Australia are going quite strongly in the direction of uh, vaccine mandates. So I've put the link on that there. So they're mandating vaccines for quite large groups, actually, occupational groups and uh, various other criteria. So um, see, Western Australia, they're heading really quite strongly towards um, mandatory vaccination for large groups of people. So you'll probably find that interesting, especially if you live in Australia, but if you're interested in uh, protecting people who uh, aren't, pe people who are vulnerable, or if you're interested in um, things like um, vaccine shouldn't be mandated, then that might be an interesting one for you to look at. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> the aspiration thing we've been talking about before. Uh, so th th this, this comes from the vaccine administration site here. Um, Centre for Disease Control. So whole things there, great detail, size of the needle, massive amounts of detail. But what caught my eye here was, um, I've called this don't aspirate, extrapolate. So the um, what they're actually saying here, that the CDC is saying in this long paper here, um, what they're actually saying is um, aspiration before injection of vaccines of toxoids, pulling back on the syringe plunger after the needle is inserted before injection is not necessary because no large blood vessels are present in the recommended injection site. Well, that's assuming that everyone's anatomy is the same, which is not. And it's assume everyone sticks the needle in the right place, which they don't. But th this is what really caught me. Um, uh, and, and, and the process that includes aspiration might be more painful for infants so this seems like this was instigated by the cdc because they want to reduce pain for infants with previous vaccination programs but of course previous vaccines weren't micro particulates and these are micro particulates and we saw when we talked to uh to, to dr dr peter from um from um netherlands from from yeah d d from netherlands that these micro particulates the body recognizes them as, as viral sized particles and initiates an inflammatory response to them so this is a different type of virus a different type of vaccine completely different type of vaccine and yet we're carrying on with the same um the same rules which just seems a bit perverse to me it has to be said so maybe i can just show you um 
briefly now that this is this is just a news clip here i think i think we've got this now from from cumbria actually where i work and clearly we're watching uh, an experienced clinician at work i'm just going to play that from the start again because we kind of missed a bit um so here we are. So this is just a, a young lady here getting vaccinated, asking a few questions. So there she's drawing it up and in it goes, draw back quickly and inject. Let's watch that again in a bit of slow-mo. So there we go, in. Now watch that. She's drawing back, doesn't see blood, therefore she injects. And this is clearly uh, an experienced, uh, experienced clinician giving the uh, the vaccine dose. I might even recognise her. She didn't have a mask on because it's my my part of the uh, my part of the world. Okay, so um, there we go. Now I'm just going to read a, a couple of a couple of clips from you. Um, this is, I can't resist these at the moment. It's a bit naughty, but they're, they're just from they're, they're the things you've put on. So th th these are direct quotes from you. Uh, so Rich, um, talking about um, people's experiences with uh, with getting uh, vaccinated and asking for aspiration. I then asked her to aspirate the needle and explained I had heard the hypothesis that vaccine fluid getting into the blood and circulating could be associated with adverse events. We agree, Rich, thank you. Uh, she, the vaccinator, looked at me like I had two heads and said what I'd heard was a myth. I don't think it's a myth at all. And I've been doing this for injection for 40 years. And of course it needs to circulate. Wrong, 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 wrong. Zero out of 10, she's failed. It doesn't need to circulate. The whole point is, is that it stays in the muscle. Because whether it's the adenovirus vector or whether it's the mRNA vaccine, the whole point is you put it into the muscle it goes into the muscle cells. Some, some will go into the lymphatics under the arm, for sure. But it's the idea, it's the muscle cells and the immune cells under the arm that actually synthesise the antigen. It does not need to circulate. It's the antibodies that circulate. She's wrong, 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 wrong. You know, you almost get the, 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 the impression that some of the uh, clinicians doing this would have difficulty um, differentiating between the gluteus maximus and the Rollerican process. Um... I mean, you'd almost think that the, the Oracle process, of course, is that tip of your elbow uh, just there. Anyway, let's let's go on. Um, now, I'm no medic, but I know that it's the antibodies that circulate once your body has started to produce them after the mRNA vaccine has been produced in the muscle cells. Correct. And, and, and in the lymphatics as well. But you are quite correct, Rich. Uh, so so. She, she then said they are not allowed to aspirate, which suggested to me there was no point going through the stress of going to different centres, only to be told it's a programme-wide effect. It, 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 it is, unfortunately. Um, it, it, we're just that we think it shouldn't be. She then had the nerve to say, in a rather eye-rolling way, look, no blood, as she removed the needle. This is utter, utterly unacceptable, uh, which I thought is probably just as well. So... Um, what an attitude from a healthcare provider. Really, this is totally unacceptable. We must reach concordance with our patients. We have to have concordance. We have to agree. There has to be ongoing consent here. Um, Monique, my guy at... and I, 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 I haven't got the nerve to say where it is, but uh, you can look it up in the comments. Literally Googled aspiration in front of me. <laughs> And then said the same thing as that ch uh, Chips person said to the video you said yesterday. Dear me. So the vaccinator actually had to Google what aspirate meant. I mean, say no more. OK. Right, so I think uh, we'll leave that there. Thank you for watching. Now, we're going to go to our community health project in Uganda and get a very brief update from uh, Beleri, who was the lovely young girl that we saw recently who was taken to hospital with the jaundice. So over to uh, Wafafa. Thank you, Wafafa, and we look forward to this report now. Days ago, 
uh, we went to Mayuge district to visit a young girl uh, who is called Balira. Now I came to know about that young girl about a month ago and she was having a uh, jaundice which I thought that maybe it was uh, due to uh, a problem with a biliary tract uh, but uh, uh, the parents and caretakers thought that uh, Balira was bewitched so I took a lot of time explaining to them uh, some of the causes of jaundice and I convinced them that uh, uh, that jaundice may be due to an underlying condition which needs to be detected. So uh, the grandmother allowed us to go with her to the hospital and uh, we did the, the abdominal ultrasound scan, uh, we did the hemoglobin electrophoresis, we did the CBC, LFT and also RFT. Uh, so uh, they did the abdominal ultrasound scan and they found out that there was nothing wrong with the biliary tract uh, but when uh, they did the hemoglobin electrophoresis they found out that the young girl was having a uh, sickle cell so uh, also the CBC was showing some neutrophilia uh, which was suggestive of uh, a bacterial infection so they decided to admit uh, Balira and as I talk she is receiving uh, treatment so I think they're about to discharge her it may be tomorrow or the following day but as I talk they have started her on some of the medicine that uh, they give patients of sickle cell and at least we've been able to find out uh, the problem uh, Balira was suffering from so thank you very much friends for supporting us uh, we went uh, to Mayuge, then from Mayuge we went to Jinja, uh, but we came back safely. Thank you very much for enabling us to get uh, this vehicle. As you can see, it is parked right there. Uh, we are still okay, we'll in the community, the... Uh, but all I want to say is that it has helped. Do uh, get more details by logging on the link that I have uh, provided. So just a little bit of explanation there. Um, jaundice is, is, is the presence of what we call bilirubin. It's a bile breakdown product in the blood. And it gave a yellow eyes and a, a different tinted colour to the skin. In lighter skin coloured people, the skin actually looked yellow as, as well. Now, um, this is not caused by uh, witchcraft. So jaundice is not caused by witchcraft. There's, there's three causes of jaundice. It can be pre-hepatic, hepatic, hepatic or, or post-hepatic. And I've done videos on that if you would like to watch them. Now, all those initials that were Fafa was reaming off there, like LFTs, well, that, they're, they're different liver function tests to see how our liver was working. Because, of course, when someone goes yellow, you want to check on the liver. But she was actually diagnosed by the paediatrician that were Fafa sent her to, using your funds, it has to be added, uh, they looked at the haemoglobin electrophoresis, which means they were able to look at the type of haemoglobin it was, and it was sickle cell anemia. This is, this is what we call an autosomal recessive uh, inherited trait. Any one child, typically there's a 25% chance they get it. Unfortunately, uh, Bellaria got it. And now she'll have that basically for forever. But she also had a neutrophilia. Now, neutrophilia means there's lots of neutrophils in her blood. And neutrophils increase in the blood when there's bacterial infection. So what she seemed to have is some bacterial infection. Um, didn't seem to be in her gallbladder, which is where if I thought it might be originally, because they did scans on that and it looked, looked, looked okay. But what she probably had was, was some intercurrent bacterial infection, which exacerbated the, uh, the sickle cell disease. Caused the breakdown of the red cells, and that's what caused the, uh, the jaundice. Uh, so it would be a prehepatic jaundice. Um, now, as, as, as Bellario was uh, picked up by Wafafa, and he explained to the parents that uh, jaundice is not caused by witchcraft, um, Bellario was actually on the way. They were actually about to take Bellaria to the new, uh, to, to, not, not, not the new, but the, to, to, the, to the local uh, witch doctor. And I do not want to think what he might have done to her. Whereas Wafafa intervened, explained to the parents, they accepted the explanation, and he took her to a proper paediatrician. So, um, that's a, a good news story. Almost certainly saved that young girl's life, to be quite honest.
Okay, that is us for today. Links to Rafafa's uh, community health work below, which we're doing as in association with as in association with this channel. And uh, thank you for watching.